uh, after, the, after the call. So thank you all uh, for being here today. Uh, my name is Jared Cates. I'm with the uh, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. I'm with, here with uh, Rochelle Sparco, also with the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. Um, we are a farmer. CFSA is a farmer-driven membership-based nonprofit that supports farming. Uh, that is good for consumers, good for our farmers and farm workers, and good for the land. Uh, we've been around uh, since 1978, and uh, we do a lot uh, to support farmers and food systems uh, around North and South Carolina. Um, we do this through um, our farm services um, uh, team, which is working directly with farmers uh, on um, all sorts of issues that farmers are facing. Uh, we have a food system team that is working on uh, to support farm and food businesses. Um, as well as community food projects across both states. Um, and then we have an education team uh, that does a lot uh, to educate the uh, community, the broader community, about uh, sustainable farming and, um, and what that is, and also provides workshops to, to farmers um, uh, around the state. Um, so uh, we are on, we also, CFSA also provides uh, advocacy support, and that is the team that is with you all here today. Um, uh, the CFSA policy team consists of our executive director, um, uh, Roland McReynolds, uh, uh, policy director, Rochelle Sparko, our South Carolina policy director, Katie Wellborn, and uh, myself, uh, our community mobilizer, um, Jared Cape. Um, and we work uh, at the state and federal levels um, on a variety of, of policy issues, working to ensure that uh, policies at all these levels are working to support uh, sustainable family farms uh, and food systems uh, in the Carolinas. Um, another part of this work is uh, community food strategies. Um, CFSA is also a team member of community food strategies. Um, this is an initiative of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems um, that has project partners at CFSA, Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project, and also CareShare Health Alliance. Uh, and we work with uh, food councils across uh, the state, uh, supporting them in their work. Um, so this webinar today is uh, meant to be a broad update on North Carolina um, uh, policy issues uh, for everyone in the state of North Carolina, for farmers, and for those food council members who are interested in learning more. Um, this is a, a map of food councils across the state, so we encourage you, uh, if you have a food council in your community, um, get up with us and we can connect you with them. Uh, they're all doing uh, some wonderful work in their communities on food system uh, engagement. So our agenda for today um, is to uh, go through and, and have an update for everyone to hear about a recap of last year's uh, General Assembly short session. Uh, we'll go into a current lay of the land uh, to talk about um, where things are right now. Uh, we'll go into some uh, issues that we see possibly on the horizon. Uh, and then we're going to talk about upcoming advocacy opportunities um, that are coming up uh, in North Carolina very soon. Um, and then at the end, we're going to leave about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for some questions. Um, so, again, I apologize if you're not able to, to see the slides. It sounds like some people are seeing it and some people are not, um, but we will send those out at the end of the meeting. So if you could please mute no, yourself goody. so we can hit the presentation, and then uh, we'll do some questions at the end. So I'm going to hand it over to Rochelle. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us and for bearing with us as we tried to get you all the slides. Hopefully most everyone can see them. Um, and if not, like I said, they're, they're not super important for you all. They're more to keep me on topic and from wandering off into the weeds. Um, so we're going to get started now talking about um, state-level policies in North Carolina um, by talking about last session. Uh, at the General Assembly. So for those of you who aren't aware, the way that the legislative session works in North Carolina is that in odd numbered years, uh, like this year, we have what's called a long session, which starts in January and goes until the legislators decide to go home. And in number of years, we have a short session um, where legislators come to Raleigh in April and go and home out. whenever they decide it's time to go home. Um, so last year, our short session was pretty long. Um, legislators came in in April and stuck around until October. Um, and there were a few things that CFSA was following pretty closely that are highlighted here in this slide for those of you who can see it and for those of you who cannot. I'm going to touch quickly on the Farm Act of 2016, which is a 
pretty lengthy um, what's called an omnibus bill where a bunch of little pieces of fairly unrelated legislation all get packed together into the same bill. We'll also talk a little, about, a little bit about the Healthy Corner Store Initiative, as well as revisions and changes to the law that um, legalized the production of hemp in North Carolina. Um, and then we will also talk about the Disaster Relief Bill, um, somewhat sadly also House Bill 2. Um, and so um, to get us started, the Farm Act of 2016, that big omnibus, omnibus bill that I told you all about, uh, that one is Senate Bill 770. God, this is terrible. You can access um, old legislation and current legislation at ncleg.net, ncleg.net. Um, and the Farm Act of 2016, you can look it up by its name or you can look it up by its phone number. Well, then we talk. Um, so some of the pieces of this bill we didn't care a great deal about. One about, oh, there was one about mattresses that we were not, a piece of it that was about like mattresses and the labeling and the stuff that's in mattresses. Uh, but there was also a lot of stuff in there about agriculture. Um, and so just to make sure that you all know what happened last session, uh, we're going to touch on a few of the big things, the big changes um, that that bill brought, ab brought about to North Carolina. Um, one of them is a new way of handling emergencies, um, kind of like the flooding that happened here this fall, um, but this, bill bre uh, this law predates the flooding. Um, essentially what it did is it went ahead and moved out of the governor's office the need for the governor to call a state of emergency in order to mobilize services and money for um, agricultural damage in North Carolina, and it moved that authority into the Commissioner of Agriculture's um, purview. And we've seen a lot of that happening over the past few years where things that normally would be housed with the governor, decision-making authority, um, regulatory authority, has been moved into the Commissioner of Agriculture's portfolio. And so this is another one where now the Commissioner of Agriculture can, in the event that there's some uh, risk to farms in the state, call an agricultural emergency and mobilize local level and state level authorities to take action and can also make use of state funds to address that disaster. Um, one good thing, not that that was bad, but that was a thing that happened. One really good thing I think that happened in this bill was that it began requiring training for soil and water supervisors, whether they're elected or appointed. So there are both types of soil and water supervisors in every soil and water district, and only the appointed ones, I believe, were required to receive training, um, which was just sort of a weird oversight that's now corrected. Um, so hopefully the training is happening and hopefully folks are finding it worthwhile. Um, there is also a local preference for, uh, or a, a preference for local produce in schools portion of that bill, which some folks got really excited about thinking that it had the potential to expand farm to school in the public school system in North Carolina. Um, we are still trying to figure out exactly how or whether that local preference actually does expand access. And if we are ever able to figure that out, we will let you all know. Um, last year's bill also moved deer farming, in, uh, legalized deer farming, and put that under the purview of the Department of Agriculture. Um, it also exempted horticultural uses from Sedimentation Pollution Control Act regulations, um, meaning that horticulture um, operations like nurseries don't have to comply with laws that um, prohibit certain types of pollution of waterways. Um, again, a thing that we're seeing a lot of is the Farm Act being used to erode environmental uh, protections in North Carolina. Um, and there was also a, um, a provision of that bill that allows for swine and poultry waste um, to be um, designated as renewable energy facilities um, oh my and orders public utilities to review those renewable energy projects if a farm or an aggregator of that waste wants to use that waste as, a, as an energy source, um, they get moved to the top of the list for review by the public utility um, above any other type of renewable energy. So their projects will be reviewed before wind farms or solar farms, for example. So big bill. 
Um, the other three things that are um, from this past year that I wanted to mention are the Healthy Corner Store Bill. Um, it's actually not its own bill anymore. It was um, eventually funding for that effort was placed into the budget. $250,000 were allocated by the General Assembly to help corner stores or small footprint uh, food stores to get a hold of coolers or shelving um, if they use those coolers and shelving to sell local or not local necessarily, but fruits and vegetables um, as well as protein, so fish and meat. Um, and the Department of Agriculture has been tasked with implementing that program. The application went out in January. Um, for now, because the amount of money is so small, only counties east of I-95 um, in the eastern part of the state are eligible to get these um, coolers and shelving units. Um, but there is an effort happening this year to expand that Healthy Corner Store initiative statewide, and there will be an ask to include a million dollars in the budget this year um, of members of the General Assembly. Um, there were some revisions to the hemp law. So hemp was legalized for production in North Carolina in 2015 um, with mm -hmm. some controversy because the bill was passed without ever going to a hearing through a sort of nefarious batch of shenanigans. Um, but there was some work done by a number of groups who are interested in bringing industrial hemp production to North Carolina um, to gain a bit more credibility with legislators. And so the bill was amended in 2016 and um, Industrial hemp production is legal. The bill authorized a, a hemp commission to get started in North Carolina um, to make rules that would explain exactly how hemp could be grown legally in North Carolina. The hemp commission has been meeting. It has promulgated rules. Um, it has published those rules and made them available for notice and comment. And it has developed an application for farmers who are interested in, a, in um, getting certified to grow industrial hemp in the state. We believe that the application will be available next week. Um, and if anyone is interested in applying and needs more information, if this is the first you're hearing about it, um, can certainly get in touch with me. My email address is at the end of this presentation. And if you can't see the slides, my email address is Rochelle, R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at carolinafarmstewards.org. And one last thing I wanted to touch on from last year's session um, is disaster, a disaster relief bill, again, that's the new HB2. Um, and included in that bill was um, funding for Cherry Research Farm, the levy at Cherry Research Farm, which is located in Wayne County in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Um, their levy was destroyed by flooding in October um, as a result of the hurricane, and all of their, not all of them, most of their research fields were flooded. Um, and the levy repair um, is, was necessary because we thought that there would be some rain this spring, which there so far really hasn't been. Um, but because the breach to the levy was so severe, there was concern that any, any small rise in the Noose River um, would reflood Cherry Research Farm. And so a part of that disaster relief bill um, included money to repair the levy at Cherry Research Farm. And engineers have been out there and have been working. Um, to, to make sure that those repairs get made. Um, all right, so current lay of the land. Not much is happening yet, even though the General Assembly has been in session for about a, a little over a month now. Um, and so rather than touching on bills, since very few have been introduced and, and fewer still that relate in any way to agriculture or food, um, we're just gonna give a quick overview of kind of what things look like after the election. Um, so one really, the only really big thing that happened is that our executive branch shifted from Republican control to Democratic control with the election of Roy Cooper. Um, that means that the Council of State is impacted. Um, the governor appoints, in the past, the governor has appointed, um, uh, the heads of, the, uh, has appointed folks to the Council of State, which are the agency heads for, say, the Department of Commerce and the De Department of Environmental Quality. Um, during a special session in December, the General Assembly made those appointees subject to confirmation and there's, by the Senate. Um, there's been a battle going on in court and at the General Assembly over the past few weeks about how that will actually play out. 
for now, the folks that the governor has appointed to those positions on the Council of State are doing their jobs. And it kind of remains to be seen how the General Assembly and the court system in North Carolina will handle the fact that they have not been confirmed by the Senate. Um, there's no change in leadership at the Department of Agriculture because the Department of Agriculture is um, not an appointed position, it's an elected position. And the Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, Commissioner Troxler, was re-elected this fall. And so he'll be serving out another term. Um, and so I don't think we can expect any sort of major changes or upheaval over there. Um, as for the state government, uh, the General Assembly, uh, very little changed. Um, there was a net gain in the Senate of one Republican. There was literally no change in the power balance in the House. The same number of Republicans and Democrats are showing up this year as last year. Um, that being said, there are a bunch of new people, freshman legislators over on Jones Street. Um, a lot of folks retired. Um, and so they were not reelected, obviously, but members, oftentimes members of their party were elected. Um, and so some districts have a Democratic representative where they used to have a, Republic, a Republican one and vice versa. But overall, the net numbers are exactly the same this year as they've been in the past. Um, our next batch of slides, just to give you all an idea of who's in charge of what, with as many retirements as there were, um, though the ultimate power balance didn't shift, some of the actual folks holding the most power, namely committee chairs, did change, and we wanted to let you know who those folks were now, um, particularly if you live in the district of one of these chairs, um, you hold an outsized role in, in helping CFSA and the farmers and food businesses and the consumers in your community advocate for policies that are good for farmers and good for food businesses and good for people and the environment. Um, and so that was a, a large part of why we wanted to give you guys a list of who's on these committees and who chairs them. Um, the chairs of the committee have a particularly powerful role in deciding which legislation that's referred to their committee will actually get a hearing. Um, and so if there are good bills that they're kind of sitting on, you guys can influence them to hear those bills. If there are bad bills that are in the hopper and that they're supposed to hear, we can discourage them from bringing those bills up for a committee hearing, for instance. Um, so our first committee up for some discussion today is House, the House Agriculture Committee. Um, here the chairs haven't changed much. Um, one representative retired who was a committee chair, um, and he was not replaced since there were three others. Um, and so those three continue with the work that they were doing in the last legislative session. Those are Representative Brody, Representative Dixon, and Representative Steinberg. Um, and we've also got information off to the side for those of you who can see it about when the House Agriculture Committee meets. And as of right now, there are no bills that are um, waiting to be heard in their committee because, like I said, very little legislation that has anything to do with food and agriculture has been introduced yet. Um, our next committee is the House Appropriations Subcommittee for Agriculture and Nat Natural and Environmental Resources. Um, or sorry, natural and economic resources. So here you see uh, the list of chairs, Rep Representative Dixon again, remember he was also one of the co-chairs of the um, House Agriculture Committee, Representative Kay Hall, Representative McElraft, and Representative Ross. Um, the, the activities that the House Appropriation, the House Appropriation Subcommittee does, um, they handle the budget for a number of agencies and one of the agencies that they have, um, that they hold the purse strings for is the um, NCDA, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And so we do keep a pretty close eye on the activities of this committee, mostly to make sure that they're funding, um, funding the projects that, that we think are important ones. Now we'll move over to the other chamber and take a look at what's going on on the Senate side. Um, so the Senate Ag and NER Committee, the um, Environment and Natural Resources Committee, um, is chaired by Senator Bill Cook, Senator Norman Sanderson, and Senator Andy Wells. Um, 
again, this committee, just like on the House side, is going to handle substantive legislation about agriculture and um, natural and economic resources legislation. So any sort of substantive bill will come through their committee if it has to do with agriculture. Um, our next slide is the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee for Ag and NER. Again, just like on the House side, these folks don't typically handle policy, but they do hold the purse strings. Um, and so, again, they're going to have some control over the amount of money that the Department of Agriculture gets and where, uh, which parts of the Department of Agriculture are getting that money. Here, again, we're going to see some overlap um, in the chairs. So Senator Bill Cook chairs both the, the Substantive Committee and the Money Committee, the um, Appropriations Committee. Um, and here he's joined by Senator Rick Gunn and Senator Trudy Wade. All right, and now we are moving on to issues that we see coming up. Um, what's going to happen once things start moving at the General Assembly? Um, one big thing is that we expect another disaster relief bill um, to supplement the new HB2 from December. Um, so like I said earlier, the special session allocated some money to uh, make sure mainly that uh, firefighters from the from the wildfires in the western part of the state got paid promptly um, and also allocated some funds to other things, um, mostly hurricane damage related, including the cherry research farm repairs. Um, and there was a lot of discussion during that um, during that special session in December, that this was a, a very quick bill to move money to people who needed to get paid and to discrete projects that needed to get completed very quickly, and that once all of the damage assessment was done, there would be a much larger disaster relief bill during the regular legislative session. And so at some point in the relatively near future, we expect to see a pretty big disaster relief package um, start moving through the General Assembly. Um, we know that they are in particular interested in making sure that farmers are compensated for uninsured agricultural losses. And so if any of you are farmers who have uninsured agricultural losses that stem from the hurricane, or you know of farmers or think you might know of farmers with uninsured agricultural losses, please let me know as soon as possible. We did a lot of outreach at CFSA right after the hurricane to our farmer members to see if they had losses. Um, and by and large, very few people came forward and reported anything, um, and no one's gotten in touch with us in the meanwhile. Um, if we don't hear about those uninsured agricultural losses very, very soon, it is very unlikely that they'll be included in the disaster relief package. So I just urge you all to be in touch with me if you or someone you know of has those type of losses. Um, the disaster relief bill that we expect to see coming soon will also include funds for housing, and we'll also include funds to help non-agriculture related business losses. Um, I don't know exactly what form those will take, but um, I'm certain that there will be a great deal of media coverage if and when this disaster relief bill comes out. Um, in addition to a big um, disaster relief bill, we're expecting um, a healthy corner store um, funding request again, uh, not just expecting it, we know that the request is out there. We're hoping it'll be included in the budget again this year um, again, because those 2016 funds that were appropriated were used only east of 95, um, the folks that are advocating for this, including CFSA, will be asking for a million dollars to be included in the budget this year so that we can expand that program um, to the central and western parts of the state as well. All right, there will also be an ask from the Department of Agriculture that CFSA is likely to support once we see what it looks like um, to expand farm to school um, in the state. So right now, the North Carolina Department of Agriculture has a pretty robust supply chain that moves food from farms, mostly in the eastern part of the state, but not entirely, to school systems across the state. Um, it is pretty difficult for small-scale growers to get into that supply chain um, and so we are hoping that we'll be able to work with NCDA as they look for additional funds to move more, more North Carolina produce through that supply chain that we can figure out ways um, to get smaller scale growers and growers and mid scale growers that are not currently involved in NCDA's farm to school supply chain 
um, find a way to feed them into that because certainly farm to institution is a great way to expand markets um, for farmers and a wonderful way to make sure that, that kids, whether rich or poor, are gaining access to healthy, locally grown produce. Um, now I'm going to toss phone back over to Jared, who's going to talk with you all about a few upcoming advocacy opportunities, um, and we encourage you to participate in any or all of those as it seems appropriate to you, because the more voices we have, the more likely we are to get good policy outcomes. So thanks for sticking with me through the weeds of policy. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> thanks for sticking with us while we had some technical difficulties and thank you Rochelle for sharing all of that information um, the good thing is that um, I mean the good and the bad thing is the General Assembly has not started on a whole lot of things um, so, so you do have the opportunity to make your voice heard now and hopefully influence uh, some of those bills uh, so for those of you who are following the slides um, I just want to highlight a few opportunities that we have um, that, that are available to uh, interact with your lawmakers and, and advocate for um, those things that you're passionate about around food and farming um, so one of those is not a state level um, ask, and, and that's um, an ask to um, meet with uh, your member of Congress, your senator or your representative. Um, CFSA uh, right now is um, planning to uh, support folks in, in taking some uh, in-district meetings uh, with their uh, Congress people. Um, this is in prep, preparation for the Farm Bill. Um, farm Bill is coming soon. Uh, it's due for a renewal um, and those processes to get those many working pieces of the Farm Bill um, up and moving are starting now. Um, so CFSA is looking for farmers or um, nonprofits or uh, food businesses, people who have specifically benefited from Farm Bill programs. Uh, we'd love to speak with you. We'd love to hear your story about how that uh, program um, benefited uh, you, your nonprofit, your community, or your business. Um, and if you're interested in going to meet with your, um, your Congress people, we'd love to help you prepare for that meeting and, and go with you uh, on an in-district meeting. Um, so if you are interested um, or if you know someone else who is interested, um, please contact us and, and, and we'll, um, we'll work with you on that. So for those of you who can't see the screen, uh, we have a sign up uh, for, for that uh, opportunity and uh, that is uh, http uh, signup.com backslash go backslash HN4DEO. Um, so if you go to that website or email either the seller or I, uh, we can uh, get that information to you and figure out what might make sense. Um, for other folks who um, maybe have not directly benefited from a Farm Bill program, uh, but you are interested in um, meeting with your uh, federal representatives, uh, we'd still love to support you in that and um, uh, maybe help you plan a little bit for those types of meetings or going to a town hall and expressing your opinion uh, about food and farming issues. Um, so you can also use that same link to, to sign up and uh, we will get in touch with you and um, or just email either of us directly and we can figure out how we can support you in those actions. Um, so we're going to be working on that over the next several months. Um, so get in touch with us soon and hopefully uh, we'll be going with you on a meeting here in the next few months. Um, the next opportunity for advocacy uh, is local and this is uh, in Raleigh at the uh, Ag Awareness Day um, that is uh, sponsored by uh, MCDA and um, uh, multiple organizations from across the state come out for this day to lobby in Raleigh uh, on behalf of agriculture. And this year, uh, the date is uh, Wednesday, March 15th. Um, and we will be there with CFSA policy team. Uh, we'll have um, some packets with uh, some information on CFSA policy priorities and um, what we're going to be working on in the General Assembly this session. Um, and we're happy to go with you on uh, those meetings with uh, your North Carolina uh, legislators or help you plan for your conversation. So um, you can also email either of us and, um, and let us know if you're planning on being there. Um, there's another link that you, uh, if you can't see the screen, I'm going to give you another odd sounding link for you to click on with more information for that day and uh, for you to let us know. And that is HTTP uh, backslash BIT dot LY backslash 2L 5D 86H. So hopefully you follow that. Or if not, you can just uh, email either of us individually and uh, we can, can provide you with some more uh, information about that day. Um, the other opportunities that we have that are ongoing and um, not specific to uh, uh, the first half of this year, 
um, is some strategic networking and advocacy planning support um, that we have available through our work um, on community food strategies. Uh, so we uh, have some technical assistance available uh, for community groups and for food councils that are interested in uh, thinking about uh, issues that they are willing to advocate for uh, and planning for some strategic networking with policymakers uh, and then making a strategic advocacy plan. Um, so if you can see the slides, we have a website that has a lot of those tools on there. Uh, that's www.toolkit.communityfoodstrategies.com. Um, and we're going to have uh, technical assistance available for community groups and food councils um, through 2017. Uh, so if you are interested in learning about those opportunities uh, or learning about um, how to engage with those tools, uh, you can please just email me directly, uh, jared at carolinafarmstewards.org. Uh, <clears throat> um, so we'll hopefully we'll be working with, we're already working with a few council, a few food councils around the state on, on um, I'm planning for these types of actions, and uh, we'd just love to share these tools and resources with anyone else who's interested in meeting with elected officials and policymakers and, um, and advocating for some change. So that is the end of our uh, presentation. Um, just again, I've, I entered in both of our email addresses into the, the, the chat box, so hopefully if you couldn't see the screen or the screen now, you can have our uh, contact information. We encourage you to check out our website, www.carolinafarmstewards.org. Um, and that is it. So we want to just open it up now for uh, general questions about uh, North Carolina policy around food and agriculture, and hopefully we'll have some answers for you. And if not, we will go find them and bring them to you. So um, any questions from the group? This is the time to unmute yourself. <laughs> Hey, y'all, this is Laura Lawfer. Thank you for doing this. Um, we're going to have a, a meeting here at A&T next week uh, on hemp, and uh, they're, they're billing it as a, uh, information for farmers about research, which I thought was, um, was interesting. Do you all have a concept of, um, you know, with the committee, you know, are they going to be – is it a dual focus of research and production? Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. Federal law um, requires that if states legalize the production of industrial hemp, that it be done in a research context. And so what hmm. North Carolina has done is it has pretty broadly defined what a research context is. And um, basically, Farmers who get a license to grow industrial hemp in North Carolina will be agreeing to provide some very basic information about their production to the Department of Agriculture, um, and that that will, they believe, fulfill the research requirement. Um, as far as I know, the type of information that they'll be looking for are things like how many acres did you grow, or if you're growing in greenhouses, how many square feet. Um, what variety did you plant, and how much did you harvest. And the last time I took a look at the rules, the how much did you harvest was not real clear, so I'm not entirely sure whether they're looking for, uh, you know, by weight, by how much money you made from it, um, but hopefully we'll get some more clarity from them as we kind of move through the process. But it's some pretty basic information that will help um, help the Department of Agriculture demonstrate to the feds that it's a research-based project. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Annette Stevenson. Um, Rochelle, Jared, it's uh, Edgar Miller with the Conservation Trust. Hang on, Edgar, we've got Annette first. Hi, hey, um, so so, Jerry and Rochelle, this is great information, and um, I just want to connect with you after this call, we, um, trying to help get the word about if there's any um, uninsured farmers. Um, so, so mm -hmm. there's a whole network of veteran farmers that we've kind of connected with, and so that we can just do the check-in to see if they're on your list or not. Okay, great. I actually don't have a list, but I can definitely connect to them if they've not okay. talked to somebody. I just want to make sure I'm asking the right questions when I, when I call them. Okay. 
Right. Yeah, definitely hook up with me. And, and if anybody else on the call has access to some farmers or is themselves a farmer um, who is interested in getting some more information about how to report uninsured losses, please do be in touch with me by email or by phone. All right, Edgar, you're up. Great. Yes, um, Edgar Miller with the Conservation Trust. Just wanted to let folks know that Commissioner Troxer has put in a fairly significant uh, increase budget request for the Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund, which is used to acquire agricultural easements and also to fund local ag economic development projects. So uh, the request is divided into a uh, first year uh, of $8 million for doing uh, protecting farms uh, near military facilities on top of the $2.6 million for uh, the program in general recurring. And then in the second year of the biennium, he's requesting um, $20 million additional funding for general farmland preservation and ag development projects statewide and another $11 million for military in addition to $8 million for military in the first year. So I don't know what he's thinking in terms of being able to get that big of an increase. Obviously, the state is going after a lot of federal DOD money to help protect farms and forest land around military installations. Um, but that's, that's definitely a space to watch, the whole Sentinel landscape funding, uh, if the state lands a huge national REPI grant uh, there could be a lot of state funds flowing into that, which, of course, kind of disadvantages or limits funding for the rest of the state. So it's important to um, make sure they're aware of, of the need to fund these projects statewide as well. Yeah, thanks, Edgar. That's a Sentinel is the, the program that's seeking to put conservation easements on farmland around military bases and has been sucking up a fair amount of money from that Ag Development and Trust Fund um, for a while. And I'm glad to hear that they're asking for more money that they can use elsewhere in the state over the next biennium. And certainly that may be one of the things that we want to have folks talk about should you all come down to Ag Awareness Day, is making sure that, that we're not only protecting um, farmland around military bases, but that we're also looking at protecting farmland particularly in uh, rural areas that are experiencing development pressure um, as, our, as some of our urban areas expand outwards. And I just, just one other point also, the funding, the general funding can be used for the um, ag development projects, local food infrastructure projects, and I hope to see more applications and would encourage, you know, nonprofit organizations and um, others to apply to the trust fund for local food projects as well. Thanks, Edgar. I have a question. This is Catherine Elkins in Carteret. Um, hey, Catherine. Will you have – hi there. Will the, your slides be available to us after this uh, yes. presentation? Yes, we apologize for the technical difficulty, and we're just going to send the slides out uh, they won't have any notes, however, we'll send the slides out probably just to the listservs where they're all where this is all sent to before. So it will be coming soon, and we have recording. We should have recording of this as well if our technology works for us. So we might just send the slides separately and the recording out to everyone. And the little barky dog. I wish we had the barky dog with us. We would share with everyone. But we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for today. Thanks for being on. Any other questions from folks? about what's happening or what's on the horizon or any policy issues you all are seeing? I, I have something on that. I heard that um, master gardeners and cooperative extension are planning uh, a new program based around food preparation master food volunteers do you know of this is this a, a worthy organization are they I mean not organization but plan to help uh, local food uh, consumption increase 
I would hope so. I have not heard of that uh, myself. I, Rochelle is, is searching right now. Does anyone else on the, on the phone Here, call? I can, this is Laura. This is Laura from Cooperative Extension. I can answer that question. So there is a master food volunteer uh, program being developed. Uh, Dara Bloom is uh, one of the people heading that up, and I believe Joanna Lilikas from NC State. And uh, they are piloting that program, I believe, in three or four counties. And a curriculum is being developed. And, yes, it's a real thing, and it's it's great. You know, it's it's teaching uh, local people like master um, gardeners, uh, turning them into master food volunteers to, I believe, focus on things like community gardens, um, talking to people about how to buy local, you know, how to use a farmer's market, how to use your SNAP EBT uh, for local produce and things like that. I have used um, some of Dara's uh, training uh, for local uh, food staff here in um, in Greensboro. So it is it's in the piloting stage right now, but it is a real thing and it's a good thing. Thank you, Laura. That sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Laura. Any other questions or comments? All right, folks, we'll be sending all this information out to everybody. Please get in touch with us if you would uh, like to do a meeting with your North Carolina or federal legislators. And thank you all so much for uh, being on the call today. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, you, Rochelle. Bye-bye.